Um, uh, I uh, am going to give a talk on a thing called Shade, and I, I may have promised to rap, um, uh, and that might have been a lie. Uh, so I, I'm not actually going to do that. That was really just to get you in the door. Uh, and now I'm actually going to sell you on some real estate uh, ventures that I've got going on in, um, in Florida uh, that are uh, a really great idea. Um, in any case, before I get started on that, uh, I want to point out a couple things uh, because the internet, I guess, is something that people care about. Uh, these talks are online. Um, I'm actually delivering them from, uh, from that URL. Uh, so if for whatever reason you want to go home and read them again uh, you know, before you go to bed, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, you can also tweet about things uh, because I think that means that I'm more important in the general world, so that's great. Um, uh, also, if you if you love this so much that we're, we really, what you really wanted to do was uh, fork it and uh, make your own version of the presentation, uh, the slides are um, uh, Creative Commons license and in a uh, Git repository uh, that you can clone uh, to your heart's delight. Now, uh, what you also get in that Git repository is the entire um, source of my of my website. Um, uh, so I don't really know what it is you would do with cloning that that repo or or how that would make your life better. But you're welcome to, uh, and I'm not going to judge you uh, much uh, for for doing that if you do it. So, anyway, so that's where all that stuff is. Um, uh, I'm also going to try and not talk about talking about things uh, uh, for as long as I can. So um, my name is Monty Taylor. Uh, I work for a company called International Business Machines, which you uh, may or may not have heard of. Um, we, uh, we invented, it turns out, the automated traffic signal, uh, which I did not know uh, until about six weeks ago. Um, uh, which is which is honestly pretty cool. Like somebody had to invent that, right? Like that's a thing. Um, uh, before that, I guess there were just manual traffic signals, and like some person had to operate them. And uh, so we put a bunch of people out of work, uh, essentially, uh, by automating their jobs out of existence. So I'm a distinguished engineer there, which means that I stand up and talk to people, uh, which is uh, distressing for anybody who's on the receiving end of that. Um, uh, and work in the cloud division, which probably should be obvious given where we are. This is the OpenStack Summit. Um, uh, I also, uh, you may have seen me at other OpenStack Summits because I've been at all of them. Um, uh, I'm on the technical committee and the board of directors, uh, and I also help run the developer infrastructure. So if you've ever pushed a patch into OpenStack or tried to and failed, uh, that's uh, my fault. Um, so sorry. Um, uh, but it's it's led us to a wonderful world where um, it turns out that we. Uh, uh, weirdly, are one of the larger users, end users of OpenStack, uh, and have developed uh, some some thoughts and some <laughs> uh, some opinions uh, and some emotions about um, about what what it means to do that. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and I'm realizing now that the screen is smaller than um, uh, than my, that was when I was looking at it earlier. So some of these slides might be uh, weird to read. Um, so anyway, we're going to talk about. Um, uh, what Shade is, uh, why we did it, uh, a little bit about getting started with it, uh, and actually, rather than just ranting at people, uh, I'm going to show you like code and log output and stuff. It's going to almost be technical, um, uh, which would be pretty cool. So, um, so Shade is a library uh, that uh, I started writing about a year ago. Um, as part of the Info Project, uh, and it's a Python library to to wrap up the the business logic. So we've got libraries that know how to talk uh, OpenStack APIs, um, but it turns out that um, some of the operations that uh, that are there are are difficult, uh, or take many steps, or take a different amount of steps, depending on where it is that you um, where the that you happen to be doing it. Um, there's a few things that we wanted to do. We wanted a single API that worked across all of the clouds uh, that we have uh, at our disposal. When I started writing this, I had access to three. Uh, I now have access to 20 different OpenStack clouds, um, so I've sort of gotten a little bit uh, obsessive about making sure that that's the case. Um, uh, and I want to I hide all the vendor. It's awesome that vendors and deployers of OpenStack can make choices, and they can, they can differentiate their businesses, uh, and they can do all of those things. Uh, and almost all of those choices make my life hell. Um, uh, and so I want, to, I want to try and do my best to make those go away um, so that I can, you know, use things. Uh, it's really important to support multi-cloud. I it may have come across with the other two uh, points, um, but, but really I, want to, I need to be able to write code that runs the exact same on, on each of my clouds. Um, uh, and, and we do this in production, so it's, it's fine. It's not, like, it's not just like a, a lofty goal. Um, I also want it to be simple to use. I'm a really big believer in things having sane defaults. Uh, I really hate it when I have to fill out like a config file that's this uh, long uh, to get started with something, which is going to make the part where we start off by me showing you the config file that you should set up uh, really amusing, um, if you're into that sort of uh, irony. But uh, hopefully it'd be simpler to use than, 
uh, other things. Uh, it's not pluggable, um, and it's not going to be pluggable. Uh, I, I think that that on a client library perspective is a, is a big mistake. Um, it, it just accepts the thing. So it, it's got designate and ironic and trove support in it. And if somebody else shows up and adds support for something else, that's great. Uh, the library will just have those things. And I don't care that there's eight, you know, depend library dependencies on those other things. It's Python libraries. It takes like a three seconds to install. It's not a big deal. Um, there's a asterisk by that for reason, but I'll get back to that in a second. Um, I also need it to be efficient at scale. So infra spins up and tears down between 10 and 20,000 VMs across OpenStack clouds a day. Um, so we tend to notice uh, when our usage of APIs is less than perfect, um, uh, because uh, usually what happens is we crash the cloud in question, uh, and then they yell at us. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we want to, oh, no, I kicked something. Uh, and now it's all blue, and you can't see anything it is that I uh, let's see what I what I've just done to the to the fine people. So uh, imagine that there's a, a, a slide up here um, uh, that has words on it, uh, and uh, let's let's see what I let's, this is how this is. Uh, how's that? Did it come back? Now it's red. Ah, look at that. Woohoo! Uh, this is this is live live technical debugging right there. Turns out, don't kick the thing that's underneath the, the table. Uh, so it should be efficient at scale. Uh, and this is the other thing that I think is really important. Um, the API should always be backwards compatible. So we just had a deprecation uh, uh, deprecation policy uh, talk in the Design Summit um, a little while ago, and I uh, put forth the idea that maybe we should never get rid of things out of the OpenSec APIs ever. Um, uh, and so hopefully I'll, I'll be successful in convincing things of that. But I have control over this library, uh, so I will not break you. Um, uh, it's uh, more importantly, I will not break myself. Um, <laughs> but you you get the benefit of me wanting to not break myself. Um, uh, so that's a, that's a good thing. So um, uh, currently, you can get the source code for this library uh, from the normal OpenStack locations where you would normally get things uh, because it's an infra project. Uh, OpenStack slash shade isn't going to be where you're going to get it. It's going to be in uh, OpenStack infra slash shade. Uh, it's also published to PyPy. Um, and I, I'm very happy to announce uh, that we've just released version 1.0. And that's actually a lie, because what we're going to do right now is uh, release version 1.0. Uh, oh, that's my password. Let's not show you that. Isn't this exciting? We have now released version 1.0 of Shade. Um, so, uh, so from this point forward, we will not break any backwards compatibility with anything. Uh, I hope that's exciting to everybody. Um, so this is also used in the upcoming release of Ansible 2.0, which just released, uh, just announced its second beta yesterday. Uh, we re rewrote all of the OpenStack consumption modules in, uh, in Ansible, uh, and they're all based on, on the Shade source code. Uh, also, um, again, because I work on infra, uh, we have this thing called node pool, which is the thing that manages all of the build slaves for, uh, for OpenStack. Uh, and this is, uh, we're currently in the process of migrating uh, node pool to use this. It uses it for image uploads at the moment. Um, we have a giant patch to replace all of the rest of its, uh, all the rest of its innards uh, with directly using shade. So, uh, so why did I write this? We already have Python libraries. <laughs> um, you'd think that maybe writing another Python library wouldn't be a thing that we need to do in the OpenStack project, given that OpenStack's in Python, so you'd figure that the support would be uh, pretty well. Um, so uh, there's this thing that, uh, that Mark Andreessen uh, tweeted uh, a couple of days ago, which is actually, he didn't say this, somebody else did, and I didn't attribute it because I'm a bad person. Um, uh, but I, I, I kind of like it, and so I just uh, decided to use it as an excuse to, uh, to stick it into a talk, <laughs> um, because I can. Um, uh, and, and basically the idea uh, that I've long been saying in the OpenStack world is you've got all these people running around telling you that you need to differentiate to, to, to make money and to do all of those things. Um, but actually consolidation, commoditization is where the real profit comes in. So all of that effort doing differentiation, that's cost on you. That's actually not, a, that's, it's insane for you to spend, in, spend energy doing that when if everybody would just deploy the software in one way, then everybody would win. Um, but we don't do that um, uh, because uh, because we're, we're we're not those types of people. What's that? Exactly. Uh, so, uh, so OpenSec, uh, from my perspective, leaks its internal uh, implementation abstractions. Uh, you, you, to use it, you have to know things about what the deployer uh, decided to do. It also likes to break its APIs, um, if uh, and 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 senselessly. Uh, just we're going to make a new uh, a new major version of an API, and we're just going to change the the parameter name of a parameter to a different parameter name. But it's the same parameter, and it does the same thing. But we change the name because it's you know more 
nicer, I guess. We, we like the way that it looks in the new version, uh, and that's really annoying for end users. Um, the basic concepts are needlessly complex. It is, it's, it's insanely difficult to get a VM uh, with a public IP address on a cloud in a consistent way across clouds. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways, and I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, LibCloud is a pile of garbage. Um, <laughs> Uh, client, <laughs> client libraries are, are our client libraries are really designed for server to server communication. That's their main that's their main primary use case. Python Nova client is for things like Glance to be able to talk to Nova. It's not for you to be able to talk to Nova, um, uh, and you can tell that by trying to use it to talk to Nova uh, because it'll just punch you in the face. So um, so we had to deal with this because we're we're doing sort of massive scale OpenStack consumption, um, uh, and so we. Figured as part of the why, why not share that with other people, right? I can I can encode that into a library, and the problems that I've solved for myself at the scale that I'm running at, uh, hopefully, can be useful um, for you. Uh, so I believe that this is this is what uh, Python code to boot. Uh, to upload an image into a cloud and then boot a VM based on that image should look like. Uh, it turns out this is, in fact, functional code, so this is what it looks like. Um, but I, I think that it should be this simple. It shouldn't be any more complicated than that um, uh, because it, that's insane. It, this isn't a very complicated thing that it's trying to do. Um, so I think that the existence of Shade is a bug, actually. It's a, it's a bug in OpenStack, and I don't know, we're still working on figuring out how to fix that, but um, this library shouldn't be needed, and the business logic that's contained in it should be basic primitives in the OpenStack API that anybody can use, because everything that I've had to do in this library, anybody who doesn't want to program in Python uh, has to do literally every single thing that I've done in this library. They're all necessary things. Uh, and that's that's pretty that's pretty terrible, I think. Um, so so back to this thing, uh, the the differentiation. Uh, what Shade is really about is uh, I would like to drive towards some profitable homogenization. Uh, I'm going to do my best to make the cloud work one way, uh, and if you don't like my way, tough. Um, so. Uh, with that said, uh, let's talk a little bit about actually using it to do things. Step one, it turns out, in using any cloud is uh, configuration. As much as I hate config files, uh, I wrote a library to, um, to do config mob management. Um, uh, and that library is uh, called OS Client Config. It also is, it had a 1.0 release a while back. I will not be releasing it during this talk. Um, it's a library to basically handle config uh, information for multiple clouds. So like I said, I have 17 different cloud accounts. Uh, having uh, OpenRC shell script files for each of them uh, and managing my connection to them by manipulating environment variables is an insane thing to do. Um, so, uh, so this is a thing that allows me to describe all of the clouds that I have and use them. It, it also, uh, uh, keeps track of some of the non-discoverable differences in vendors. So there's things that you cannot tell except by trial and error as to how your cloud works. Uh, and so uh, as much as I would like to fix that basically in OpenStack long term, it's not fixed right now. So I've worked around it and I have, I have some nice YAML files that to tell you exactly what it is that you should uh, be able to learn from your cloud. Uh, but right now you just have to learn it from me. Uh, it's in use uh, not only in Shade, uh, but also in Python OpenStack client. Um, so, uh, uh, so you can, you can if you in install Python OpenStack client, you can run you know, OpenStack list servers and it'll uh, consume config values from that. Um, it also, uh, and I've got patches up for other things, uh, it, it'll read not only a config file, but also the normal environment variable. So if you do only have one cloud and you just want to use the environment variables to talk to your cloud, that's fine. Like, no config files needed. You can just do the things uh, the normal way. Um, so this is a, this is a, a snippet of, um, of a uh, clouds.yaml file. Uh, like I said, it'll read the OS environment variables, or you can, you can set up some things here. So uh, right here, I've got a, um, I've got a DreamHost cloud uh, account, uh, and here's my auth information for it. And I'm referencing a, uh, a known profile of clouds. So DreamHost is a vendor. They have a public cloud. Uh, that public cloud is the one public cloud that they have. Uh, so it has known characteristics, uh, and I refer to it here by name. Uh, this is a blue box cloud uh, that the fine folks at blue box uh, made for me. Uh, and this is not a known public cloud, so I've indicated the auth URL directly. You'll notice there's no auth URL in this one because it turns out the DreamHost's auth URL is the same for everybody. So you don't need to put it into your config file. The only thing you need to put in your config file is your username and password um, because that's sort of what you would need. You'll also notice that there's different collections of things. So this is United Stack, which is based in, uh, in China. Uh, it turns out that they have problems with their SSL certs, uh, which is a little bit sad. Uh, so I've told it that we're not going to bother verifying their SSL certs because they're broken. Um, uh, they use V3 uh, auth, uh, Keystone V3 auth, uh, and down here you'll see that we've, we're listing a project uh, and user domain uh, as well. So one of the reasons that we decided to go with YAML for this uh, is that I do need some nested, uh, some nested structure, which wouldn't really work well in a normal INI type, uh, type file, and part of that is because 
although I don't have plugins, uh, Keystone does have auth plugins, and I can't get around that. Uh, and so these are, these are where we put the specific auth, auth parameters that are different uh, between the different, diff the different clouds. Um, uh, so that's, that's sort of the, the next slide here. Because the, uh, uh, the, the plug of authentication, there's very, there are different things, uh, different ways in which the cloud uh, works. We default to auto-detecting. So if you don't list any sort of auth type for your, for your connection, that's fine. You give it some username and password, it'll be like, okay, I know what it is that you want to do. Um, but if it's something that it can't auto-detect, you can also explicitly tell it, do this, uh, and it'll, it'll do its best. Um, so uh, if you use this with Python OpenStack client, uh, just on the command line, uh, you, can, you can do this based on, on information that was there in the thing. Uh, OpenStack, tell it the cloud, the named cloud from the config file, the region that you want to connect to, and then the thing you want it to do. That's a little bit too much typing for me. I find that really annoying. Um, so, uh, so what I do myself, and you're welcome to do this or not, uh, is I have, a, I have a little shell function that sets two environment variables. Uh, and uh, I just then say use racks DFW, which then tells me that the environment variables are set in my prompt. Uh, so I know what it is that I'm going to talk to. And then I can just type OpenStack servers list the, the whole time. And it, it kind of works. Uh, there's a blog post I've got on my blog about doing this. Uh, it's not really a blog. It's really just more some collections of static HTML. But um, I'm not cool enough to have an actual blog. Um, so there's a command that comes with shade called shade inventory. Uh, if you've ever used Ansible, you'll know that there's a possibility of a dynamic inventory for finding what your servers are. Um, and that's a really cool thing. And I found myself using the Ansible inventory feature and dumping it out to a cache file so that I could sort of introspect the information that was in my, across my clouds. Uh, so I went ahead and, and, and put the logic for doing all of that into Shade itself. And then there's a specific command that'll, that'll, uh, that'll get installed when you install Shade. And so if you just type it, it's got some command line options. And it will give you a list of all of the servers across all of the clouds that you have configured. Um, uh, and it'll, it'll fill in some additional information that OpenStack won't necessarily show you. Uh, an example of that is uh, right here, I've, I've normalized AZ. Uh, to be AZ. So if you have availability zones in your cloud, it'll it'll give you a, a nice one as opposed to uh, the OpenStack parameter name, which is OS EXT AZ colon availability underscore zone, uh, which as lovely a name as that is, um, uh, I thought the other one would, would be a little bit nicer uh, to normalize to. Uh, we also fill in some additional information down here. So you'll see the, the flavor in addition to having an ID. Uh, also, we went and asked the cloud what the name of the flavor name that, that is. Uh, ID 100, because it turns out ID 100 is <laughs> not very descriptive to me. Um, but standard X small is, is a little bit better. Uh, there's not a name, an image name here, because this cloud likes to change uh, and replace their images. So the image with this UID does not exist in this cloud anymore. Um, uh, but that's fine. Uh, and then uh, because it's originally driven by some Ansible work, uh, you'll see this interface IP here. Um, depending on how you have that cloud configured, there's public and private uh, IP addresses that you might be interested in. There's also IPv4 and IPv6. But what you really care about is, what address do I use to connect to this darn thing? Uh, that's interface IP. It turns out that getting that piece of information is one of the hardest things to get in all of OpenStack, um, at least in a consistent way across clouds. Um, and so you get all the other things, and, and you can see it sort of spits out here. You can get this in YAML or JSON format, or really whatever it is that you want to do. If we scroll down here to this other one, which is in a different cloud that doesn't change its uh, images out, uh, you'll see that it was able to figure out that, that this node booted on an Ubuntu uh, 14.04 LTS image, which is very exciting, I'm sure, to everybody. Um, so fundamental building block uh, is a cloud region. Um, uh, and this is sort of like a Newton meter if you're into, into, into physics, uh, except that it's nothing like that at all, except it's a compound word. Um, but essentially, uh, the, the basic unit in shade is that of a region of a cloud. Um, you create a, a, an object that refers to a specific region of one because all of your API uh, interactions with the cloud are going to be directed towards a region of that cloud. Um, so each region of the cloud is basically a distinct uh, top-level object, and underneath that, everything is, is parameters. Um, so you can either, again, get to this through environment variables. Uh, uh, you, there's a, there's a, if you're only using environment variables, there is a, uh, a nice named cloud for you named nvars. Uh, it's probably not what you decided to name the cloud, but uh, that's tough. Uh, it's just what it's named. Uh, so the combination of that cloud and OS region name will get you a cloud, uh, as will um, from your cloud config. Uh, the name and region um, things. So uh, the, the absolute simplest, simplest way to get a cloud object in shade is this. Uh, it's two lines. You get a fully functional cloud. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, import shade, and then shade opens that cloud. 
this sort of assumes that you've got some environment variable set somewhere, uh, or that you've got a uh, config file, and if you've got a config file, it's just going to pick the first cloud region it can find. Um, that's probably, if you have a config file with multiple cloud regions defined in it, you probably don't want just the first cloud that it happens to find, uh, unless you're doing something very strange. Um, so you can you can specify a little bit uh, a little bit more if you'd like to to get a little bit more specific on this, uh, and you can give it a named cloud and a named region uh, to to more clearly specify which cloud you would like to talk to. Um, if you want to do more complicated things than that, um, you can directly construct an OS client config configuration option yourself. You can get a cloud option, and you can pass in arg parse arguments to override configuration things. You can pass another key value uh, key value arguments. Basically, do all of the things you would expect to in a more fully featured application or library that's going to consume this, uh, and and do all of those things. This is a little bit too much typing for me for simple things, so I usually do the other one. Um, but this is how you get to to, to the real meat of, and potatoes, uh, and then you pass in the cloud config object. If you don't pass a cloud config object into the shade constructor, it will construct a cloud config object for you, uh, because that's the way that that works. Um, use the standard Python logging, um, which may not sound like it's a, a thing that should be uh, brought up, but it, I'm going to. Um, uh, so there is a helper method inside of shade. Um, so if you don't really feel like dealing with Python logging configuration files and setting that up, uh, that like you're just doing a simple script, you can just say, hey, Shade, set up simple logging for me that's going to stick things on to standard out uh, and turn debug on or off. Um, if you want to do more complicated things than that, it's just the standard Python logging configuration. So you can do all of the things that you would normally do. We also uh, do things in this simple logging helper function to fix the broken logging in the Python libraries. So the things that spew garbage onto your screen or, or put warnings out uh, because there are no handlers found for Keystone off base. Uh, you know, those things, we, we suppress those for you. We also suppress the warnings about Rackspace's broken SSL certs um, and, uh, lib, uh, and URL libs' uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder of, of vomiting uh, stupid warnings that you can't do anything about on the screen. We, we turn off all of those for you because no one ever really needs to see them. Um, we do a thing which is the most evil thing in the world, and I'm sorry, but there's really nothing I could do about it. Um, well, I could have done something different because I wrote it, but uh, I decided not to. Um, so we hide all of the underlying client exceptions, and we raise new ones. This is the worst programming practice in the history of mankind, and everyone who's already done this in OpenStack before me should be shot. I should be shot. Um, I'm a bad person for doing this. Um, but the thing is, is that exceptions are part of the interface. The underlying, pi I'm currently building this on top of the Python client libraries, and they're all terrible. I'm going to replace them at some point in time with something else. Maybe the Python OpenStack SDK, maybe direct requests call, I don't know. I don't want to bubble these exceptions up into the interface um, so that you depend on catching them, or more importantly, so that you have to know that for this operation you just did, on this cloud, it's a Nova operation. On this other cloud, it's a Neutron operation, um, because that makes your exception handling code for every call that you make about this long, uh, and that's a little bit ridiculous. So I'm sorry for hiding exceptions. So in any case, uh, putting all of those things together for a very simple script that actually, in fact, does something, um, uh, this is this is a script that will upload a image to a cloud and then boot a server based on it. Um, uh, we're going to set up some logging here. We're going to create a cloud. This is on Vexhost, which is a lovely public cloud based out of out of Canada. Um, we're going to uh, create an image uh, in Glance uh, by uploading the file name, uh, the file Ubuntu Trusty I'm leaving how I got that file uh, as a topic for later. If you'd like to find me over beer, I will be more than happy to tell you about Disk Image Builder, um, uh, but it's really not necessary, uh, this. I'm also telling it to please wait for that to be done, um, because <laughs> I'm going to boot on the next line. So if I'm not waiting for that operation to be done, it's going to be a very, very short attempt to uh, boot a server off of that image. Uh, I'm going to find a flavor that is, uh, has at least 5, 12 uh, megs of RAM. I don't really care what the flavor is, I just want that one. Uh, whatever it's called. Uh, it's, I'm sure it's called 1 or 100 or x small or whatever it is, but it's really not interesting to me. Uh, and then I'm going to boot a server, and again, I'm going to wait. I'm also uh, telling it to please automatically find an IP for me, because uh, thinking about the logic of getting an IP in OpenStack makes me want to stab my eyes out, uh, and so it'll do it for me and I don't have to worry about it. Um, this is, uh, this is the, the, uh, a snippet from the debug logging of having done that. Uh, so you see all of the things to do those things. Uh, I, I first checked uh, to see if the image that I'm trying to upload exists, because we actually do some, some, uh, some checksumming, so that we, if you ask me to do this more than once, I'm not going to upload the image if it's already in the cloud with the same content, um, because that would be kind of a waste of, of uh, time. Uh, 
in this particular case, uh, I was uploading a very small image, uh, so it only took 1.5 seconds. Um, uh, then we're gonna we're gonna do the image create, uh, the upload uh, because uh, this is Glance V1. It turns out. Um, then we're gonna check again to make sure it's there, find a flavor. Uh, then we're gonna go through a sequence of creating a server. Uh, we have to get the server again after creating it because the metadata that you get out of a create call is not useful. Um, uh, so you have to get it, and then. Uh, the poll list here is actually we're using server list, which is an optimization, weirdly enough, uh, that we do from node pool where we're spinning up thousands of nodes at a time. And so actually just getting the list from the server and then iterating in Python over the list to see which ones and then they're active uh, turns out to be more efficient on the cloud involved. So this is going to sit here in a, in a poll loop. Uh, look at that, poll loop. Uh, waiting for it to be done. I, s I trimmed a couple of, of waiting five seconds is off. Uh, and then uh, we're going we're gonna to finally succeed. And then we're going to do some introspection of the networking stack. In this case, on Vexhost, Vexhost is a very nice cloud and they do not require you to get a floating IP uh, for your server, so we're done. Uh, no, more, no more things uh, involved. We got a public IP uh, on first boot, which is how all of it should work, but it doesn't. Um, so a couple problems that we've solved in this code. One of them is the image API version. Um, there's a few ways you can upload images into clouds. One of them is in the V1 API with the put interface. This is what HP Catalyst IT, Data Center D, and InterNAP all use to uh, allow you to upload images. Um, the vast majority of clouds uh, use V2 put. Uh, that's, I'm not even going to read them all off, but you can see that it's more than the first one. Uh, so that's sort of the, the basic, uh, or the, the main thing. And then there are two clouds out there uh, that use uh, the V2 tasks interface. Um, uh, and so all, all three of these are different interfaces to uploading images to the cloud. Um, and I think that's a problem. So uh, you'll remember this from the Vexhost uh, example. This is the sequence of operations that I had to do to upload this image into this cloud. Um, if I go to a different uh, cloud, say Rackspace, uh, that requires uh, uh, the task interface, the API call is the same in Shade. This is it. Create image, here's the file name, go. Uh, this is the sequence of operations that it has to do on the back end uh, that you don't have to know about. Uh, so in this case, it's also going to check uh, the, uh, the Glance image list, and it's going to see that the image is not there. Uh, then it's going to go to Swift, uh, and it's going to do some introspection to see if the object is there in Swift. Um, in this case, it is found that uh, that the object is in fact not there, so it's going to upload um, to Swift. Uh, and in this case, actually, you'll see that it doesn't say manager ran because it's slightly different because we're using Swift service, which knows how to split out multiple threads uh, and, and upload uh, 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 image chunks in parallel uh, on the back end. Um, so then we will have uh, finished the object create, uh, the, uh, which shows up here, which is weird, but that's because of the threading. Uh, so sorry about that, but that's just the way that it is. Uh, we're going to check it again, and then we're going to uh, we're going to run the Glans image task create, uh, and then we're going to poll on uh, image task get to see when the image task is done importing the uh, the image, uh, and then finally that'll be successful, and we will consider that we've finished that. Um, so thank you for everyone who made incompatible APIs. Um, but it makes something fun to talk about, right? Uh, so there's another problem. Uh, that's that there are five different ways to get a public IP on your, on your VM in OpenStack. Um, your cloud can have externally routable IP from Neutron. Uh, this is my favorite model myself, uh, but it turns out I'm not the ruler of the world. Um, <laughs> that's uh, run above and OVH from France uh, uh, have that model. Your cloud can have externally routable IP from Neutron and also optionally support private tenant networks if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, that's Vexhost. Um, your cloud can have a private tenant network by default for you and require you to go through a floating IP to get a public IP address. HP and DreamHost are the public clouds that go that model. Uh, your cloud can have private tenant networking provided by Nova Network uh, and require floating IPs for external routing. Uh, Oro, uh, it turns out, out of Canada is a cloud that does it. There's a lot of clouds in Canada, by the way. I'm not sure if everybody knew that. There's like five public clouds in Canada. Um, uh, and finally, your cloud can have externally routable IP from Neutron, but not expose the Neutron API to you. Um, and that's, that's Rackspace. Um, so, uh, so again, we'll go back to sort of the same kind of, kind of code we've been looking at. Uh, and you'll, you'll see here we're doing a, uh, this is on a, on a cloud that does the floating IP requirement, uh, in this case, HP. Um, uh, we'll do the create server call, which looks identical to the other create server calls that we did, because that's kind of the point. Uh, uh, and all, all of those things. This is the sequence of things that it, it did in the background. Uh, it uh, created the server and, and did those things. Then it, it did the network list, which is how it starts to introspect the qualities of the networks in, in Neutron. Uh, it will then list for, and then it'll figure out, oh, I don't have a private, I don't have a public 
network that I'm that this server is connected to. Uh, so it'll then look for floating IPs to see if there are any available. In this case, it found one. Uh, and so it updated the floating IP and attached it to the server and then pulled the server because it turns out that floating IP attaching takes a while. Uh, and so you have to wait for the floating IP to actually attach after you attach the floating IP to the server. Um, there's another thing you might want to do, which is you might not want to reuse the floating IPs because amusingly enough, uh, as, as much as everybody likes to talk about how clouds are for ephemeral workloads, uh, they've also become obsessed with these floating IP things. The thing about floating IPs is they're actually only good for long-lived pet servers that you want to reuse the IP on subsequent uh, long-lived incarnations of that server. Um, so sort of a, a, an impedance mismatch there. Um, uh, but if you are actually doing an ephemeral workload, you don't want to reuse the floating IP on your ephemeral node after you've deleted it and created it again. Um, so in this case, when I'm booting this, I say, please don't reuse any of the floating IPs out there because this is an ephemeral node that I'm booting up. Um, so glad that that was uh, difficult. Um, so we're going to do that, introspect. Uh, we're, again, we're going to look for floating IPs. Uh, we're going to do a different thing here in the floating IP create. Uh, and actually, that's the wrong. Uh, oh, I lied to you. Uh, so this is the that's the wrong uh, uh, thing. So what we actually should do there, uh, and I don't know why the the I'm showing you the same slide twice, um, is we'll actually cre do the floating IP create with the port uh, of the server um, in it, so that it creates it and attaches it to the to the server on a on a single call rather than a create and then subsequent update of the floating IP, which is uh, slightly more efficient. Although what would be really great is if the server get had the neutron port ID attached to the IP address that it returns to you in the server record, so they didn't have to then go back to the cloud and get a list of ports and look for the ports that have the IP address of the fixed IP of the server that I got. Um, because, uh, in San because I'm pretty sure that to get the IP address on the Nova side, it had to ask Neutron uh, for the port. So at some point, New Nova has already asked Neutron for this port information, and it just wasn't nice enough to put it into the server record to give back to me. Um, and they wonder why things have problem scaling. Um, so some advanced topics. Uh, and I, I promise not all of these will be me ranting about floating IPs. Um, uh, although I promise I can rant about floating IPs all night long. Um, so uh, y you've seen all of these log lines, manager, whatever, ran uh, task in so many seconds. Uh, on the back end, uh, Shade has an implementation that we call task manager. Um, this actually came out of the node pool work. Um, every single API operation that we've got is encapsulated into a task object. Uh, and there is a task manager that runs. The default uh, task manager in Shade is basically a no-op task manager. It just runs the API call that you requested it to make. This is what most of you want most of the time, uh, and you don't have to know anything about it. Um, although it is nice because it gives us a nice place to put in logging, uh, logging wraps around each one of them so we consistently log every call that we make uh, without having to remember to do it. Um, uh, there are other things, uh, node pool being one of them, where we need to client-side throttle um, our connections to the cloud. We know what our we know what our quotas are. We know what our API limits are. Um, and it turns out that it's not particularly useful to an application that's trying to spin up a bunch of VMs all the time to spin up and spin up and then start get errors uh, and then have to wait until the errors because once we start getting errors, if we're not rate limiting it ourselves, we're now just going to slam the API really hard um, <laughs> because it's not returning us things and we're going to try again uh, because we have, we have uh, amounts of VMs that we want to get. Um, so in NodePool, uh, NodePool has a, a threaded uh, task manager that it passes into the shade constructor, um, which uh, which makes sure that there is only ever one, there's only one and only one uh, API call going on to the cloud at a given time, no matter how many threads we have running inside of the application, um, and that it also keeps track of timing. So if we know that this cloud can only take one API call or 10 API calls a second, it'll, it'll keep the timing and make sure that it waits until uh, it's appropriate to, to make an API call again. Uh, but the nice part about that is that your, your uh, programming interface to that is the same. You just you just make calls and it, it handles all of the all the thread safety issues for you, uh, which is kind of neat. Um, we also have caching built into this, uh, which is another thing because it turns out that talking to clouds is expensive, um, uh, and so we actually have there's there's sort of two layers of caching uh, going on. Um, we have a we have dogpile cache built in, uh, and that defaults to no cache. Uh, again, sort of similar to the task manager, uh, the, the default null cache does nothing. It turns out the default memory cache in, in dogpile leaks. Um, so if the default was to just do some nice friendly caching in memory, uh, you would quickly hate me because I would, I would destroy your servers, um, and that's not friendly. Um, uh, so we default to, to null cache. 
uh, it turns out that we've got support in the config uh, in the clouds.yaml file for expressing uh, cache settings that you might want to use across uh, across your clouds. Uh, this gets especially important if you have, say, eight or ten clouds and you're doing lots of operations across them, uh, being able to define that in there. So you can pass in dogpile uh, cache um, settings, uh, cl cache classes, expiration times, uh, things of that nature, and the, the, the calls that we've got that, are, that make sense to cache, things like list images. Uh, well, list images we will aggressively cache. If you create an image, we'll appropriately invalidate the, the, the image cache inside of, inside of Shade. So all of those things should just work uh, and be more efficient uh, for you. Um, there's a few things, um, uh, and that'll get in a, in a second. There, there's also in this one, uh, so DBM, it turns out, doesn't leak. Uh, it's, a, it's a decent one. It's really good for your local machine. Um, it's not really good as a shared thing. If you've got multiple processes running, the, the DBM driver is not really great. But uh, just for doing uh, uh, local operations, it's a, it's a nice thing. And it also persists across uh, script invocations. So if you're just doing lots of little small scripts, uh, you can still get benefit of the caching layer. Um, uh, there's another thing which we're sort of just starting to roll in. Uh, we have one specifically, uh, which is the, the server list. I, I mentioned earlier we use server list uh, as a way to, to, to pull for readiness of a, of a server. Um, and that's because what we do in, uh, in, in node pool is we fire off a thread for every single server that we want to create at that moment in time. And we might have 500 servers we need to create right now. And so we'll have a thread that's sitting there polling, waiting for the thing. If each of those were hitting the cloud with a get call, uh, it would kill the cloud. It has killed the cloud before. We've crashed clouds that way. Um, uh, but so what we do here is we actually have a mutex protected uh, list on uh, server list on the inside and an expiration time on that. So you can set this to zero and it'll just happily, you know, happily pull uh, immediately. Um, or you can you can tune this up so that it'll it'll do. And all of the all of the server list all the server get poll calls uh, also know how to uh, participate in that. This is a general uh, cache. The only one that we're, we're doing anything with right now is server, but it's structured so that any of the resources that you're doing something with, uh, you could associate a particular API semantic. So at, at some point, once this is fleshed out a little bit more, uh, other than server, you should be able to say like, hey, so for images uh, or for flavors, you know what? Cache those until the end of time because they really never change. Um, for for images, same thing. We've got full cache and validation, and that's a fine cycle for us in the way that we're doing it. Um, but for but for servers or for something else that some other things may be interacting with it. Uh, Neutron port list is a, is another example of this. The ports get updated anytime you're doing operations on the on the servers, the networks. So you can't just cache the port list results themselves because it's going to get invalidated from other op other actions you don't know about. Same thing with the server list. If you just do the sort of normal dogpile thing, um, you're waiting for the status of the server to change. And so you don't know when to invalidate your cache. And it's it's kind of it's kind of bad. So in this case, we do the polling thing. And all the things will we'll just sort of spin on that. Um, Finally, uh, and, and it's possible I might have gotten through these slides in the appropriate amount of time, which is weird. Um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that this is, this is in the new Ansible 2.0 um, uh, uh, things that will be released very soon as well. Um, if, if, uh, this, is, this is pretty much the Ansible playbook version of the script that I've been showing you. Uh, you'll notice that we have a named cloud uh, referred to here. Uh, we're going to upload a, uh, uh, an Ubuntu image to the cloud. Um, and then we're going to boot a server based on uh, based on that image, which is which is kind of uh, kind of fun. There's a couple of differences here in that we don't have an explicit flavor call because it's an Ansible playbook, not a Python library. Um, uh, and so in this case, from a user interface perspective, uh, you really only care about a flavor when you're booting a server. Um, uh, and and so we've got that uh, auto looking that up for you. Uh, but the same sort of same sort of semantics. And both of those have weight equals true. All of these things with the weight equals true uh, setting. Uh, will happily just fire and forget if you if you tell them weight e weight equals false. Uh, the Ansible module, I believe, also defaults to auto IP equals true um, because uh, well, I like to type YAML as little as I can. Uh, it also uh, this is sort of an example of using some of the multi cloud support. So I have a I have a set of clouds that I want to make sure that my key pair is on. Right, I have my key. It's the same key. I want to use it on all of my clouds. Uh, so this is a little Ansible uh, snippet that'll use uh, use Shade to um, for every for each of these clouds make sure that my that my key uh, that my key is on that uh, and it's really nice because I don't have to have really complicated things with uh, passing in loops of uh, of of off dicts uh, to to do this um, 
uh, which just would, it would be like it would be the ugliest uh, playbook of like you know really long things or really obtuse stuff or whatever. Um, so in any case, uh, that's that's basically what I've got. Uh, that's that's shade. It is out. You may use it. Uh, I promise to not break you. Uh, although I can't promise that your cloud won't, um, but I'll do my best to to fix it if it does. Uh, and I think I'm a couple minutes early, so if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Nope. Oh, there's a question. Oh, you're just going to troll me. Yeah, so that's a that's a real that's a real good question. Um, so the question, if anybody couldn't hear, uh, Spencer, this is great for Python, but what about other languages? Um, there's I have two sides of that answer. Uh, I've I've started chatting with um, uh, the Gopher Cloud people um, uh, at Rackspace about that Go uh, client library, not to do all of these things necessarily, um, but at least to support the 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 clouds.yaml uh, configuration file. Um, because that's at least, that's YAML, right? Like everybody should be able to support that. I, I'm going to try and get a hold of Adrian with JClouds and, and some of the other folks, probably the Ruby Fog people, and see if at least we can we can get that supported. Uh, I've also got a spec up to add clouds.yaml exporting support to Horizon so that you can just go grab a YAML snippet. Uh, and uh, Greg wrote some code that we need to get fully integrated into Python OpenStack client uh, so that you could say, take a YAML file snippet or an OpenRC shell script snippet and say, please add this to my local clouds.yaml. So like like an import cloud config uh, kind of thing. So that's one side of thing. That's easy to do multi-language. The problem is, is that there's just a crap ton of logic in here to deal with all of the differences in the in the different clouds and the vendors. So as much as I've got indications in the vendor files, uh, in the uh, uh, so the OS client config thing, uh, when you install it, it will install a bunch of YAML files onto your system that contain the description of each of the clouds that's out there. So those could be consumed by other other languages as well. And if people start doing that, we'll probably split those files out into their own thing. So you don't have to install a Python library to get config files for a Ruby library, for instance, because that would be kind of rude. Um, uh, so that's that's one thing. But all of the logic then, even to consume those those settings, would have to be replicated in, in each of the things. So um, how how we get from a sane uh, library interface to uh, not needing all of that logic is some of the work of DEF Core uh, and some of the work that we're doing with, with the other things. But ultimately, I think that the best way to get that interoperability there is, is to drive OpenStack itself to not need uh, complicated business logic at the library level. So yes? Um, it is part of this, but uh, it was kind of uh, what is the compatibility with non, like we saw Glance and Nova and mm -hmm. Neutron. Yep. But what about the projects? Uh, it, it is, it is, it's basically open to any OpenStack project. I've added support to the projects that I use uh, at, or that I want to use um, or that people have sent in a, a, a pull request to Ansible and said, hey, I want to add support to this project. And I'm like, oh, well, funny story. We need to go add support to Shade first uh, because we do not accept any, any OpenStack modules to Ansible that don't talk to OpenStack through Shade. Um, so I'm like, oh, hey, you want support for, oh, great. Let me tell you about the fun we're about to have. Um, uh, and that usually goes pretty well. Um, but so we'll, we'll, those will be, but it's, it's basically as, you know, as people have an interest, if somebody comes up and says, hey, I really want to add, uh, you know, Solometer support, I haven't added that because I don't have any clouds that give me a Solometer API. So I, I don't, you know, I, that isn't a thing that I've, I've personally uh, needed to mess with, but it's all, it's all open. We are pretty uh, obsessive about making sure that, uh, functional tests. So all of all the shade patches go through uh, live dev stack functional testing. Um, so uh, so we we do we spin up three different dev stacks. One with Keystone v2 enabled because v3 is now the default. Uh, one with Nova Network and one with Neutron uh, to make sure that we're testing against as many configurations as we can uh, as we can approximate with dev stack. There's some public cloud configurations that it would be exceedingly hard for us to approximate with dev stack because you know, it's their deployment, but we do our best there. So we try and get functional tests to those uh, as well as as well as unit tests. But we actually prefer functional tests because it, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Are you just supporting public OpenStack clouds? No. Uh, so the blue box cloud that I that I mentioned there um, in uh, is is one of the clouds that I currently have. It's a sort of managed private cloud that that I was given. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Shrews and I got accounts on. 
uh, on a, a cloud from MetaCloud, um, uh, which is also a, a managed private uh, for uh, for that thing. Uh, and, and yeah, we want to make sure that this supports all of the, supporting private clouds is harder for us because we don't have them. Um, uh, whereas it's easy to go out and stick my Amex on a, on a public cloud and get an account and spin up a server occasionally and make sure that things work. Um, but I don't have a data center of, uh, of hardware to you know, run RDO or, you know, or fuel on or whatever. So, um, but we definitely want to support. Yeah. Yeah. Would absolutely. Yeah, I would absolutely love. So my my goal is that both Shade and Ansible and anything else that uses uh, Shade should be able to work on any OpenSAC cloud that's out there. Um, and uh, in general, I would I would hope that. So it turns out a lot of times when I get my hands on a new cloud, I don't have to do any work. Um, uh, the amount, as much as I like to pick on differences, there's actually only three or four different ways that the clouds, I found most of the ways that the clouds are different at this point. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice when you go in and like somebody's like, hey, here's a, you know, like the, the MetaCloud folks, we, we spun it up and the same with the blue box one. I was like, yep, everything just works. It's great. No, no need to, to add new support for things because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing. But yeah, if for whatever reason there was something about a, a fuel deployed cloud that we weren't picking up on right or that, that we'd made an assumption about a, an interface that wasn't a real assumption, that would definitely be grounds for, for a, a fix. Yeah. Yeah. So the OpenStack inventory plugin in Ansible uses the uses the same code as that shade inventory command. The main difference is that the shade inventory command does not. Uh, does not the the, o the Ansible inventory command also creates uh, groups. Um, so in in the YAML output, uh, the the main list of servers is sort of shifted over under a under a, a grouping, and there's a whole bunch of like uh, like it, it puts everything in the same AZ in one group, and everything in a region in a group, and it creates as many useful groups as it as it can. Um, when you're just running this on the command, that's not really particularly useful if you're not running it in the Ansible context. So this runs without the group creation logic and just gives you the list of, of servers. Other than that, the, the fundamental code that it's running inside of Shade is, is the same and the additional information that it introspects about each server is the same as the, as the Ansible inventory stuff. So it's more for like, hey, I kind of like that extra information I get from Ansible, but I'm just sort of poking around in sh on the shell right now. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's a sort of a good way for informational poking for, for me. If it's useful to other people, neat. <laughs> uh, cool. Oh, one more. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. So that. And this is. This is a thing where. Where. Uh, one of the reasons we default to. To null and, and sort of would need you to opt in to. To doing it. If you have multiple, actors changing the image list, if you have multiple actors that are changing the image list, for instance, but they're all using shade to do it, uh, then you can use one of the shared caching backends for Dogpile like Memcached or Redis, uh, and then you would actually have a, be able to have a shared cache. Uh, that would that would do that. If you, on the other hand, have uh, another actor that's changing the image list that isn't associated with that same caching infrastructure, uh, then then yeah, you're gonna you're gonna get you're gonna get false uh, false negatives. You're gonna the, the cache cache hit misses is, is gonna is gonna be sort of off. So that's that's one of the reasons we can't just assume that it's always always right. But if you're all if all of your things are going through that, then it, it should it should do the right things. And if it doesn't, it's a bug, and it means that our testing of the cache invalidation flow is is buggy, and we should fix it. Anybody else? What's that? Beer, yes, excellent. Beer or whatever else it is that you like to drink if you are gluten intolerant. Uh, so cool, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>